Sarah checked her phone 247 times today. She doesn't know this number, but her phone does. Her phone quietly logs each desperate swipe, each unconscious reach into her pocket during conversations. It even tracks that 3 a.m. glow illuminating her face as she scrolls through notifications that arrived while she slept. By conservative estimates, she'll spend over four hours staring at that six-inch screen, fingers dancing across the glass in patterns so automatic they barely register in her conscious mind. Now, Sarah isn't unusual. She's exactly what Silicon Valley designed her to be. Every ping, buzz, and flash of your smartphone triggers the same neurochemical cascade that hooks gamblers to slot machines. This isn't coincidence, it's the result of decades of deliberate engineering by some of the smartest behavioral psychologists and neuroscientists that big tech money can buy. The parallels are striking and intentional. Slot machines use what psychologists call variable ratio reinforcement, the most addictive reward schedule known to science. You don't know when you'll win, but you know that if you keep pulling the lever, eventually something good will happen. Sometimes it's nothing, sometimes it's a small payout. Very rarely, it's the jackpot that floods your brain with dopamine and keeps you coming back for more. Your smartphone notifications work exactly the same way. Most of the time, that buzz in your pocket is nothing. A promotional email, a software update, a friend posting lunch photos. But sometimes it's something genuinely rewarding. A text from someone you love, a professional opportunity, a piece of news that makes you feel informed and connected. And very occasionally, it's the digital jackpot. That viral post you shared getting hundreds of likes or an unexpected message that changes your day. Your brain can't tell the difference between pulling a slot machine lever and swiping to unlock your phone. Both actions trigger a release of dopamine, the neurotransmitter that doesn't actually make you feel good. It makes you want to feel good. It's the chemical of anticipation, of craving, of maybe this time. And just like casinos discovered decades ago, the most effective way to generate that craving isn't to give people what they want consistently, but to give it to them unpredictably. The comparison to gambling isn't metaphorical, it's genealogical. Many of the techniques that make our phones irresistible were pioneered in casinos and then deliberately adapted for digital platforms. B.J. Fogg, director of Stanford's Persuasive Technology Lab, has trained a generation of tech executives in what he calls captology, the study of computers as persuasive technologies. His students have gone on to design the engagement systems for Facebook, Instagram, Google, and virtually every major tech platform. They understand that persuasion is most effective when it doesn't feel like persuasion at all, but rather like choice, convenience, and connection. Nir Eyal, author of Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, created what he calls the Hook Model, a four-step process for creating user habits, trigger, action, variable reward, investment. Tech companies have implemented this model with scientific precision. Trigger, the red badge on your app icon, the buzz in your pocket, the fear of missing out that companies deliberately cultivate. Action, the simple swipe, tap, or scroll, actions designed to be so effortless they become unconscious. Variable reward, the unpredictable stream of likes, messages, updates, and content that might be boring or might be exactly what you didn't know you were looking for. Investment, the content you create, the connections you make, the data you provide, all creating a sense of ownership and making it harder to leave. But perhaps no one understands the addictive potential of technology better than the people who built it. 
There's a reason why Steve Jobs limited his own children's screen time, why tech executives send their kids to tech-free schools, why former Google design ethicist Tristan Harris calls smartphones the slot machine in your pocket. Inside your skull, your smartphone is rewiring your brain in real time. Neuroscientist Adam Gazzali's research shows that our brains haven't evolved to handle the constant stream of interruptions that digital devices provide. Each notification doesn't just interrupt what we're doing, it fundamentally alters how our brains process information. When your phone buzzes, your brain releases a small hit of cortisol, the stress hormone that evolved to help our ancestors respond to immediate physical threats. But notifications aren't saber-toothed tigers. They are, they are artificial urgencies designed to feel important while really being truly urgent. Your brain, however, cannot tell the difference, so it treats each ping like a potential crisis that demands immediate attention. This constant state of alert is rewiring your neural pathways. Studies using brain imaging technology show that heavy smartphone users develop patterns of brain activity similar to those found in people with substance addictions. The areas responsible for impulse control, the prefrontal cortex, show decreased activity, while the areas associated with craving and compulsive behavior light up like Times Square. Dr. Anna Lemke, author of Dopamine Nation, explains that our brains maintain dopamine balance through a process called homeostasis. When we repeatedly spike dopamine levels through digital stimulation, our brains compensate by reducing baseline dopamine production. This leaves us feeling anxious, restless, and craving more stimulation just to feel normal the classic pattern of tolerance and dependence that defines addiction. The result is what researchers call continuous partial attention, a state where we're always slightly distracted, never fully present, constantly scanning for the next digital hit. We become human hummingbirds flitting from notification to notification never landing long enough to go deep into thought, conversation, or experience. Tech companies didn't stumble into creating addictive products. You guessed it, they systematically engineered them. Internal documents from Facebook, obtained during congressional hearings, reveal that the company's own research showed Instagram was harmful to teenage girls' mental health. They knew it, studied it, and then decided that user engagement was more valuable than user well-being. The red notification badges that make your phone look like it's bleeding for attention, well, those were specifically designed to trigger anxiety and urgency. The infinite scrolling that keeps you browsing long after you've seen everything interesting, yep, that eliminates natural stopping points that might allow you to disengage. The algorithmic feeds that show you content designed to provoke strong emotional reactions, those keep you engaged by keeping you agitated. Even the physical design of our devices is intentionally addictive. The smooth glass, the satisfying click of buttons, the way phones fit perfectly in our palms, industrial designers call this tactile addiction. And it's why you find yourself picking up your phone, even when you have no intention of using it. Former Facebook executive Sean Parker admitted that the company's founding generation understood exactly what they were doing. We need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content and that's going to get you more likes and comments. He called it a social validation feedback loop and acknowledged it was exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. The consequences of treating human attention like a commodity to be harvested are becoming impossible to ignore. 
Rates of anxiety and depression among teenagers have skyrocketed in direct correlation with smartphone adoption. Sleep disorders are epidemic as blue light from screens disrupts circadian rhythms and the anticipation of notifications keeps minds racing. Relationships suffer as people struggle to be present with each other when their devices are constantly competing for attention. But the damage goes beyond individual well-being. Our democratic discourse has been fractured by platforms designed to amplify outrage and division because angry users are engaged users. Our economy increasingly depends on capturing and monetizing human attention, creating perverse incentives to make technology more addictive rather than more useful. We're raising a generation of children whose brains are being shaped by algorithms optimized for corporate profit rather than human flourishing. The most insidious aspect of smartphone addiction is that it doesn't feel like addiction. Unlike substances that create obvious impairment, smartphones provide the illusion of productivity and connection while gradually eroding our capacity for sustained attention, deep relationships, and genuine presence. We mistake the frenetic activity of digital consumption for meaningful engagement with the world. So where do we go from here? The solution isn't to abandon technology, it's to demand that technology serve human flourishing rather than corporate engagement metrics. This requires action at three levels, individual, social, and regulatory. Individual sovereignty. We must treat our attention like the precious finite resource it is. This means creating phone-free spaces and times in our lives, bedrooms, meals, conversations with people we care about. It means turning off non-essential notifications and choosing when to engage with our devices rather than allowing them to interrupt us constantly. Most importantly, it means recognizing that the urge to check our phones isn't a character flaw, but a predictable response to systems designed to create that urge. Social renaissance. We need to rebuild cultural norms around technology use. Just as we developed social expectations around smoking in public spaces, we must create new etiquette around digital devices. This means normalizing phone-free gatherings, teaching children that constant connectivity isn't normal or necessary, and modeling present moment awareness in our daily lives. Regulatory revolution. The most crucial change must happen at the policy level. We need regulations that treat attention as a public health issue, not just a market commodity. This could include requiring nutrition labels for digital products that disclose their addictive design elements, mandating algorithmic transparency so users understand how content is selected for them, and creating liability for companies whose products are designed to be addictive. The European Union's Digital Services Act points toward a regulatory future where tech companies are held accountable for the psychological impact of their products. We need similar legislation that recognizes human attention as a commons that deserves protection from exploitative harvesting. But perhaps most importantly, we need to remember what we're fighting for. In the moments when we put down our phones and look up at the world around us, when we really look with sustained attention and genuine presence, we remember what it feels like to be fully human. We remember that the most meaningful experiences in life can't be captured in a notification or reduced to an engagement metric. The slot machine in your pocket will keep buzzing, flashing, and demanding your attention, but you have a choice that no algorithm can override the choice to recognize these digital interruptions for what they really are, and the power to put them in their proper place as tools that serve your intentions rather than systems that exploit your psychology. Your attention is not a commodity. Your presence is not a product. 
Your humanity is not a resource to be optimized for someone else's profit. It's time to take it back.